this could be lunch, <laughs> but it isn't because it is one of the one of linguistics best kept secrets on my purpose. My name is Dominic Lokesh. I uh, work for the Sexy Action as uh, a learning technologist, but my background is in sort of pure linguistics, and I also am a co convener of our structure of language module on our postgraduate course. So, so that's why I am speaking to you about this. Thing. I have been doing online for presses that is very high. And you will wish after you see some of this stuff, I hope, that you have me will have too, and hopefully you will continue doing that. Now, I, uh, the title on this thing is different, but I think online corporate can be a literacy teachers, or any teachers, that's can, and this is, I'll show, show you why. So, I assume, that perhaps not everybody here knows exactly what the purpose is, but I have a show you show of hands of who who is who has heard of the word corpus. Okay, who hasn't even heard the word before? It's only a few people. Who hasn't uh, who's used the corpus before for something? Okay, all right. So if you have used it, then they have, perhaps you know there won't be that much new. But I think maybe I can show you a few tricks that might make this worthwhile. Um, so, I'll talk about what the purpose is for those who haven't uh, heard it, maybe, you know, throw in a few interesting tidbits for those of, of you who have. Uh, then we'll get right into what sort of questions can we uh, answer using corpus? What language do we need to use to ask those questions? And, and then we'll talk about, about how that can work in the classroom or before the classroom or after the classroom in the basic, how it fits into the life of a teacher. I even have this um, utopian section here, which we're definitely not going to have time, but if we do, we could have a bit of practice and, you know, we can start answering your questions at the end. What are the chances of that happening? You know, I should probably set up a watch so that uh, I include those chances. So, what, what is a corpus? The plural of corpus is a corpora. So, one corpus, two corpora. Uh, what is it? Well, it is, a co it is something that helps us find out about how language really is. Traditionally, the language classroom has been driven by what we linguists call pres prescriptivism, which, we, which means telling people how they should use language. So they say, don't end a sentence with a preposition. Don't use passives, those sorts of things. And that's uh, many people's favorite pastime. And many people on my side of the, of the, of the, of the line of this sort of divide uh, of the linguist, my, my favorite pastime is looking at the sort of things people say as prescriptivist and using the corpus showing how wrong, wrong, wrong they are. So descriptivism is something that actually now we're trying to introduce into the language classroom how language really is used. And how do we know? Well, in the old days, the way we knew was between a sat and thought and said, okay, I think this is how it is. And then we had the corpus, and I'll review in more detail what that is, and then realize we were wrong. This is so easy to be wrong with just your head. You're not, it is not enough to just use your head to figure out how language should be used. Enter the corpus. So it's a modern tool, well, it's you know, 50 years old or so, to finding out how language works, but only now in the last four years or so, it's actually become so easy to get for anybody that it's, it's you know, it's, it would be a shame if you did People didn't use it, uh, if people didn't get, uh, take advantage of it. So it is basically a giant database that is representative of our language, of English, Spanish, whatever. So we'll be talking about English. And basically, the way it becomes representative is because there's a collection of samples. So linguists go about the world, they take a bit of language from newspapers, people language from fiction, put it all together to make sure that it's representative to roughly kind of. E, you know, e, equals out, so it's not just uh, from newspapers, it's not just fiction, you know, it's all sorts of including the spoken language. And they end up with a database of hundreds of millions of words. But you need to go that big to be able to say meaningful things about language. But it's not just any hundreds of millions, it's hundreds of millions from different genres, mostly written language, but there's some spoken language 
and about the samples are two to three to five thousand words in a corpus, right? So you don't go and just say, well, I want all of Shakespeare, and that's, you know, that, and that's, that, that tells me something about English language. There are some specialized corpora uh, that are, for, instance, for example, the Time Magazine corpus. So you can look at how you just change the Time Magazine. That's also available online. But in, in general, uh, the, the corpora that you would be using as teachers are sampled, and they're in sort of hundreds of millions of words. Now, what are they good for? Uh, the first one, sorry, as I said, in the sort of in the sixties was the first corpus that appeared, and they're good. They're being used now for making grammars. So the most famous of them is the Comprehensive Grammar of the English Language, of uh, eleven hundred plus pages of it. it. Was based on one of the very early corpora that actually slightly predated computers. There was a a bit of a, just about the same time as computers started emerging, people started looking for how they could do that, to create a corpus. The American Heritage Dictionary and many, many other dictionaries, most of the Oxford dictionaries, are now based on, on a corpus, basically. You don't just think, hey, what does you know, that mean? You go and you search for it, and you sort of see which ones are the mo most common uses. And also, the many learners' grammars, particularly for foreign language learners, CoBuild was one of the biggest, and they even advertise it on the, on the cover. Also, most of the other ones don't, but it's going to cover the Collins corpus, which um, is quite large. So which corpus? So basically, it can be used to do like big, you know, expensive grammars. It can also be used in the classroom by anybody. The Collins, uh, the Collins Cobo corpus is about one billion words, I think now, and it costs thousands of pounds a year in subscription. It's, you know, it's hard to get to that, but luckily. Through uh, the good uh, offices of Brigham Young University in Utah, Mormons have been really good to linguistics. They have developed so many tools over the last last twenty years or so in book reviews, and one of them is COCA. And COCA is the Corpus of Contemporary American English. I'll, again, this will be available. You need to take notes. And that's available for anybody. It is American English, but we'll see that actually doesn't particularly matter. Uh, Mark Davis, the guy who did, who created COCA, also created an interface for something called the British National Corpus. And then we can also quickly mention at the end how we could use some online Google as a corpus. Okay, so this is this is the front page of the BNC, the British National Corpus, which was a big project in the UK, but unfortunately only covers slang English until 1994, and that's 100 million words. Then we have the COCA, which we will be talking about, which uh, is 425 million words and counting. So you, here you see its current language, but American English, um, created by Mark Davis, free for everybody, on the AmericanCorpus.org. Is if you see actually if you Google COCA, which is amazing given what other things COCA could be, it's second. Yeah. So that I, I would say, yay for linguistics. Yeah, this is good. This this is. Uh, you know, this is not, I'm just not talking. Uh, so, and then there's what Corp, uh, which is developed at University of Birmingham, uh, which is uh, basically a linguist search engine. It searches Google and Bing and Yahoo and all these others, and will give you sort of some better results. But we won't really talk about it, just so that you're aware of it. Now, so, so I told you what a corpus is, and now uh, why would you want to uh, use a corpus? So basically, a corpus is a good way of, of checking your intuition. So you may have an intuition of this is how this is always spelled, or there are no words ending in. And uh, those intuitions are almost always wrong, unless they're backed up by, by a corpus, uh, by a corpus search. And either it's you who did it, or somebody else had done it and told you what the rule is, so, you know, so, so but even, but I just don't, I wouldn't trust a grammar Written, you know, before the 80s, and all of these sort of things. You know, basically check anything that's on there. Okay, well, okay. So, for example, for example, how do we use the word dyslexia? Well, we can ask ourselves some of these questions, right? So, we'll start at the higher level, uh, and we'll, then we'll kind of drill down to the classroom level. So, we could say, you know, we speak more often of dyslexic children than adults, or we speak more often of dyslexia than any other BYS word. So, is there, what, what do you reckon? Which one? Did, just look at these first two. Do you, do you think that's true? The first one, we speak more often of dyslexic children than adults? Yeah. Who's for yes? Yeah. Who's for no? 
Okay, we'll check those. And then, who thinks this is true? We speak more often of dyslexia than, than any other word that begins with D Y S. Think it's yeah. true? No, who's no? Okay, who's? Yeah, okay, okay. So let's 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 see. So basically, the first thing you can do in a corpus is get what's called a concordance. And concordance, uh, for those of you familiar with uh, things biblical, started with you know in the early days when people needed to figure out. We quickly find things in the Bible, so they make basically a long list of words with references to where they are in the Bible and how they're used, and also some cross references. In a on a in a corpus, basically, it means that you do a search and you get a list of words. So what I did to, to check to test our hypothesis whether we speak about more often about dyslexic children than adults, I just did did a quick search for dyslexic followed by a noun. I'll explain what this means in a minute. So I'll just just believe me, this means followed by a noun. I did it in the BNC using uh, the COCA interface. And I see dyslexic children, dyslexic child, dyslexic person, dyslexic boy. So we see dyslexic children win handily. Dyslexic in American English, same thing. So they even have children and kids. So we can see, yeah, that's right, we speak. I mean, that was kind of, that was a gimme. But here we have a good kind of evidence. And not only then do we see, can we see what, you know, whether it's children or not, but also what sort of things that we said. I'll show you how that and work later. Now, the second question, BYS words. So we were right. Well, we were all, you were very, that statement actually needs to have been, we're right. <laughs> because you can make a strong statement, except for dysfunctional, which is kind of an easy, easy one. And Dyson, which doesn't count because BYS isn't, isn't a prefix. Dyslexia, you know, then if you add dyslexic to it, then, you know, then it's very close up. So it's, it's pretty much other than dysfunction, which is a generic word, if I make sense. I mean, it is far more. I'm, not, I'm actually, you know, I was surprised that you know, this structure didn't get more, or even this and stuff like that. And I, was, I never heard of dysplasia, for instance. So I actually, and here's, you can find out about meanings of words using a corpus. So I said, well, I quickly like did a quick search for dysplasia, and I searched for the context. You know, what, what other words appear near dysplasia? And I said, okay, five words hit cervical temporal bone. Yeah, I'm gonna have have a bit of a sense what this place I could be about, and and I could go drill down and I could find more. So I could even I could even basically here take a shortcut, and I had I had one up on the lexicographers. You know, because people who make dictionaries they're not gods. They don't actually know. You know, but very often what they do take, tells us more about them than about uh, the language. So I can often you know if, I, if I'm worried about a meaning of a word, this is where I would go. So, so that's kind of one way of looking. Let's go. To, let's take it to the classroom. We tell children about suffix, suffixing words, okay? And uh, and you have, I assume many of you will have prepared worksheets, exercises, little things, how you know how to explain. So here's one a suffixing word. So what is the difference? One do we have Y E D and one do we have I D E, right? This is a hard thing to figure out on your own. It's well, no, it's impossible to just sit down put your finger to your brain and say, okay, what is it? In the old days, people would sort of start taking lots of examples, but you're never sure what are the exceptions. You know, is, it, is it a good rule? Is it a bad rule? It takes a lot of work. Now, your students can do it, or you can do it. As, so you can say, okay, let's search for Y, Y, E, and I, E, D. This means, and I'll explain again the language of this, is means all words ending in Y, E, D, and all words ending in I, E, D. So these are the results I got. Then I just put them all together, and I highlighted the letter that again that's just before the the suffix. And I was saying, what do these things have in common? You know, what could that possibly be? And you know, anybody here who doesn't know? Because <laughs> I, you know, I can leave it as homework if you, if you don't. Know. <laughs> So these are this you know, is suspiciously all consonants. These suspiciously all vowels, vowel letters at least. Uh, and uh, so here you go. There's your rule. And you can use it either yourself if you're kind of checking that there are no exceptions to that rule before you go into your classroom, or you can just use it with your kids if you, if you give them homework. Say, do this sort of a search. You know, figure it out. See if you can. You know, I mean, it's that's it's that easy. Now, what is the corpus match? What is the thing that makes it all possible? 
And, it, and those are, these are basically, you need to learn this, this, and this. And with all of these sort of three new additions to your language, you can all of a sudden transform your, your life as a teacher of language. I might be exaggerating slightly, but deep down I feel I'm not. So these two things are actually very useful in general. They're called wild cards. And many people don't know about them, but even if you search on your computer and you put this in front, you know, in the middle of the file name, it will find any other any characters in that in the middle. So basically, this asterisk means find anything, any letters, any amount of letters in this space. So find anything. Sometimes that's too much. So enter a question mark, and that says find only find only one letter. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. But what you could do, you could have two question marks if it said find all two letter words. You just have two question marks after. These brackets will find you a lemma of a course. A lemma of a word. A lemma is basically a corpus jargon for all the, de all the possible derived forms from that word form. I'll show you again how that works. So this is how the lemma works. Uh, if I search for book in those square brackets, it will find me book, books, book, booking, because those are all the possible, no, all the possible, uh, did I say derived, I meant inflectional, sorry, all the possible inflectional morphic forms of, of book, either as verb or as noun, and I'll, talk, I'll show you how you can search for just noun or just verb in a minute. However, if you search for booking, which is a derived which is, a, which is a derived form of book, it will show booking and bookings. So that means, for instance, very interestingly, if I search something about teachers and I put the lemma around it, I will find, it will find both teachers and teacher. So I don't have to do two searches. So basically it's a shortcut. The same thing about a verb, if you want, it will find you past forms and, and so on and so forth. So. Now, the next, the next thing, have lied a little bit when I said you only needed those brackets. Also, these, there's one more thing. There's a, there's a full stop. That's a useful. That's a useful thing to have. Okay. Because we all know that sometimes you know the words can be different parts of speech, and that kind of makes uh, makes for annoying results. So if you want to make sure you only search for run as a noun, meaning you know a run, uh, a brief run, on the run, and things like that, you say. Run, lemma, you know, run and runs, both of both forms, but only pronouns. So you say full stop, and then you use this little, it's called the tag, and say this word has to be a noun. Right, so this you say, found all runs when it's a noun. And this, again, you put in square brackets and you put this little n asterisk that stands for noun. That's, that's what you have to, that's what you have to learn, and I'll, that's the one more thing you have to learn. Okay? If you don't put the full stop in, and this is another wonderful little trick, I actually missed saying asterisk here, so my apologies, that's wrong. Uh, is it says, Paul, show me all the examples of run, followed by a noun. Right? Now, here's, let me tell you, there's a little bit of a deep, dirty secret about corpora. There, uh, well, it's not dirty, it's not secret, but it's, uh, lots of people forget about it. Is that this is whether something is a noun or not is decided by a robot, artificial intelligence robot, basically. Because you cannot have even you know even with the sort of slavery that is imposed on undergraduate students sometimes in these conditions, you still cannot have pack enough undergraduate students to go through a corpus and tag all the words in it. And surprisingly enough, when you do the reliability studies, you find that the undergrads actually aren't that much better than the AI robots. They're a little better in some contexts. So, so for instance, run a file, you know, is it a file, a noun, well, perhaps, you know, we might sort of discuss that. Uh, but, you know, run things, run average. So here you see, here you see what happens when you have run followed by a noun. So these are all the examples. So, so, so that's, a, that's, a very, that's, a, that's a very useful thing to know. Remember, the difference between this and that is the full stop in between. So this makes it into a tag, and this makes it into any, any noun. And here are some uh, common tags that I use. N for noun, verb for B for verb. Unfortunately, the British National Corpus uses AJ for adjectives and AB for 
uh, adverbs, and the coca uses J and R for, for adjectives and adverbs. It's a little annoying thing, uh, but it's, that's the only difference. Generally, they use the same tags. And now let me explain the asterisk in the, in the noun tag. Is that it says any kind of noun. But you can actually, you know, there's any noun letters in here. But you could drill down and say I only want plural nouns. And, and so something followed, you could say round followed by plural nouns. What are the plural nouns? There is a list of all the tags, so you don't have to remember all of them. I just, you know, just after a while, just kind of you remember nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs. But generally, you know, for the, the more specific ones, you, you'll have to you know, look up the list. Here is verb in the past tense. So you can say, when is, you know, I followed by a verb by a stanza, because the most common uh, verbs in the past tense. As I said, this looks a bit scary by now, I think. Coca has a wonderful question mark. So at any point, wherever you are, you click on the question mark and it gives you examples and it gives you set, tells you what to, what to put in there. So don't, don't worry. So, I'm, you know, so you will leave here being able to kind of, don't expect, don't think I'm expecting you to go home and just kind of fire it up and type it all in. It will take maybe 15 minutes of practice with some of these help buttons. Uh, but once you once you're there, it's it's very easy, it's very easy. Okay, so here are some more examples of searches. So if I search for the asterisk alone, uh, I get anything. If I search for big, followed by nine, I get stuff like big bang, big man, big house, love. I get in, as in in let's see, love in in square brackets. This is the love, loves, love, loving. But here's a fun one. Hook. Preceded by an asterisk gives me look, handbook, show textbook, but look book preceded by a question mark only gives me look book book book. So it gives me only you know, so that's that's quite a handy thing. Imagine trying to come up with a list of words that end in look and have only one letter before the look. Good luck with that. Here, one second. So and there are some, and, and here, of course, as we say, I want to see strike as a verb, and it's strike, 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 striking. If I want to see strike as a noun, I get only strike and strikes. I didn't realize how topical I was. <laughs> <laughs> and if I search for love, I, um, you know, I find just the word love. But then I click on the word love, and I get lots of uses of love. So that's the next bit that you need to uh, that we need to uh, So when you come according, so, so far I've only see shown you how you find words. But the really powerful stuff is something called quick. And quick stands for keyword in context. And basically all it means is that you search for you were search for all the nouns ending in I E S. So I got a list of them. And then I click on one of them, cities, and it gives me a quick overview of a bunch of sentences, you know, hundreds of them really, thousands, that have cities, and I see what's before and after. So I can quickly see, all oh, right, okay, so all of the cities, so, so I can, so you just click on that, and you have 10 sentences that you could give your students immediately as an exercise, depending on the level. And I'll show you how to work with levels in a minute. Here's a bit more. Here's a bit more uh, advanced keyword in context, where I can see color coding and a bit of shaping. So, so immediately I see, I see, you know, I, I can see the words ending in I V S in here, and I see what are some common shapes and patterns of sentences around them. So that's another thing. Of course, one of the things that you will discover. Is very often the adults you will get the, the, the words you get out of some searches are adult words, not even but like dirty words, but adult words like you know recession or something like that. So you may want to you can limit your search by whether it's spoken fiction magazines or academic, but you can also limit it by fiction types. So say you own from juvenile fiction, so that will give you much better words. And there's also juvenile magazines, so you can you can say you only search for stuff from juvenile fiction or juvenile magazines. And that should give you better words. So you know, because depending on the level of language you're working on. So this is just showing you anything that's a rule can be discovered in a corpus. 
particularly if it's a word level rule. It's, it gets a bit trickier if you get that sentence level rules because then you have to get quite, sometimes quite creative. So don't beat your head against the wall at the beginning as beginners could, and just, just search for words. By the way, great way of cheating at crosswords. <laughs> So here are some other questions that we can answer. But these are some, some questions that we can answer with the corpus. Are there more nouns or verbs ending with IES? What's your record? I don't know. I'm not, I haven't actually done the search, so I don't know. But this is a search. If you can do a search, IES, all verbs ending in IES, all nouns ending in IES, all you. Basically, when I say ending in IES, means I translate it into asterisk IES. That means any string of letters ending in IES. Now I put a tag verb or tag dom. Are there four letter verbs ending in ed in the present tense? You know, that could be a very handy thing to know because in, in, inevitably the children will come up with something when you, when you tell, after you tell them, no, there aren't. <laughs> yeah? so, so this is a useful thing, useful thing to do to put that. What are the most common adjectives describing students versus pupils? So that could be a useful thing to know if you kind of want, you know, with your with your learners. What do we say teachers do most often? <laughs> yeah, that's a homework because you'll, you'll you actually be quite amazed when you do these searches. You wouldn't expect some of that, some of that stuff. Or maybe maybe uh, it's always something first. Can you can you correct this? I couldn't understand the grammar of the student one. Why why is the student in the second bracket? Oh, sorry. When it says verses, it means you have to do two searches. Oh, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. No, you are absolutely right. I mean, an idiot. This should be pupil. One is pupil, one is student. Right, sorry. Right. Yeah, so that there's an error on the slide. Thank you for showing me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'll give you something that many of you may or may not know. And this is, I believe, one of the most important recent discoveries about language that hasn't quite made it into the teaching profession yet, even though. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's there, but I think it should be there more. And it's something called collocation. Can I just get a show of hands who knows what a collocation is? Alright, so it hasn't made it far enough in the teaching profession. But it should have, because it's absolutely essential to language. Because we have this view of language that is just kind of, it's a combination of anything goes. You know, if it's a verb, a noun, subject, object, you just gotta put them together and you have a sentence. But that is true. But actually, in reality, very often, things go together more often than not. So, so you're better off with your learners preparing that exam with examples that actually are more common, more frequent. So if you search for the word surprising, and you would uh, say, you know, show me all the words that follow the word surprising, this with this little asterisk and a, uh, in the context, and again, the question mark will show you how to do it when you're doing it. You say, well, surprising that. That's not, it's not surprising that that happens, but it's actually quite useful to know. So you see, surprising, surprising number. That's a useful little sort of subsection of language. Surprising because, surprising given. So when you, you know, so when you kind of look at it actually as surprising, it isn't a random thing. There are some things that are more, you know, surprising things, surprising how. There are some things that are more common than others. Yeah? So you might be tempted to say. So, you know, a surprising event, but that isn't anywhere near there. There's no such thing as you know a surprising happening. Nothing, nowhere near as common as surprising that. So when you're teaching the word surprising, I don't know if you teach the word surprising, but you know, if that sort of thing comes up, this would be a better example. There, are these, the same thing goes for certain. Okay? So when you have a certain followed by now, certain amount, certain level. These little numbers show you sort of how high the culpability is and the high number. Without anything over five, is, uh, over four, I think, is, is, is good. Is that? Do you can do something like that. Mm -hmm. You can go to the Vietnam Academy or something like that. Yeah. And actually, look more specifically at what students do compared with what. Yeah. 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 You can see what they're more likely to be exposed yeah. to in, in the language that they, that they see. So here is a good one. Teacher must follow by a verb. So, you know, so again, Teachers must be, must have, must learn, must become. So you can even have these. And I would say, I, would, I kind of wish I could have stolen one of your slides on, on, on shape over here. So because this is, this is the shape. You know, this is exactly what you can do. You have these little shapes, these little sort of fill-in sentences, and you can do searches and see what are the most common words in here. So 
So it's, you know, so instead of having shapes, you have to, you know, it's not so not necessarily for teachers with language impairment, but for their teachers it certainly could be, uh, because you could just instead of the shapes, just remember those little cones, and then you can insert them and get a bunch of sentence patterns that are actually quite common in language. Okay. So this is about the code cup, you know, the, the, so the corpus of contemporary American English. It also, that same interface also allows you to search the BNC if you particularly need British English, but for the sort of things you're searching for, you don't generally need, there really isn't much of, enough of a difference. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so, so that's quite a useful, and also has a time corpus. So the corpus, COCA, if you Google COCA, the second link will be to the corpus, but you also have the link in, in this kind of slide on the web page. Okay, so. Other thing, you can now, you can use Google as a quick corpus. That's particularly good if you're searching for something is, that is not common, but all you have to do is put quotes around the search. And then use an asterisk, the same thing. So except the quotes limit into its exact sentence. Because otherwise, if you don't put the quotes in, then Google will find, will put other sentences. But if you, so feature is, asterisk, the quotes around, these are a bunch of suggestions. This is what people are most likely to search for, but you can also get the results. It's a, it's a very useful thing, particularly for high level, higher level sort of conceptual things. So if I wanted to search, you know, uh, comparing different nations, you know, French are like, Czech are, Czechs are like, and then you actually get really interesting uh, results about prejudices that people have. So this, so this is not so much about morphology or syntax, but it's about more higher, higher level, uh, you know, sort of patterns that, that are around. Google searches are particularly useful if you have very rare and low frequency usage. So the sort of stuff that might find into the urban dictionary. Because the corpus, even though it's used to alpha 30 million words, everything's going to be in there. Well, actually, there isn't. And at particularly the low frequencies, sometimes things are overrepresented because it could be just so happens within a 2,000 word sample that you, a word that's really rare is used 10 times. So that could happen. So the corp so, so so Google is good for the, for the incredibly rare um, uh, things. The con obviously there's no sampling. So 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 if somebody uses something once by mistake or by because you know because they felt like it, you'll find it. But you don't we don't know if it's representative at all. But if it's only there's only one instance of it, you know, Google is probably good, uh, a good uh, hint that it's not particularly frequent. The other uh, obviously the the other thing about Google is that it doesn't have any genre, you know, so you don't know which, it could be just, you find something a million times, but it's only in one genre, so that's another important thing to remember. The one thing is don't trust the Google comments. Google will give you like this, it's a hint, but it's completely unreliable. Uh, so, so don't, you know, so, so just be, be aware of the comments that you know, This font is worth a million, you know, 200 million times, something like that. I actually once went through all, you know, the bottom of the numbers, went to all the other, I said, okay, I want to see the 100 millionth example of this page, of this one. And it, it ends at about 20, you know, so it doesn't actually even let you see. So, so those numbers are just completely unreliable. Uh, so don't, don't use them much. I mean, as I said, they could be a hint. They could give you a hint, but you can only base a comparison on them. Uh, um, and, and it has been shown that sometimes different people do the search and they get a different number of them. So. Now, there are some limitations, so beware of, of overusing the corpus. So, always when you use a corpus, I mean, we have the COCA and the BNC, but if you were using another one, always be aware of the limitations. How, what is the size? What is the coverage of genres? What is the coverage of years? So, I know some people are trying to use the BNC to search for uh, Survivor, and they were expecting to get, you know, something about the show, but there was nothing about the show because the BNC ends at 94. So, you know, so you, you have to kind of be aware of, be, be aware of those limitations. Uh, again, I already warned you about low frequency results. Sometimes, by accident, a really rare word will show up as more frequent than another really rare word, just completely because one sample had it ten times. So when you look on the page, always look how many from which samples it comes, because it shows you, it shows you where it came from. So it can show you the bigger context. Yeah. So that's the next thing. Check that your results come from multiple sources, that it's not all from one sample or one. Uh, and uh, always, very often, sometimes you get a result in the sort of the, the word that you don't click on that word that you get as a result because you get a quick list. And sometimes you see, oh, actually, this isn't what I thought it was because it, so, so it's important to check your results. But, and, but do remember to limit them by genre as well, which is quite handy. 
One other common error is that people, when you do morphology searches, like call the face, uh, so you get preface, and you think, okay, well, that's a, pre that's a prefix for face. So it's useful to check stuff in the etymological dictionary to see if preface and actually see if it is it. The etymology is different. Which, as we know, doesn't necessarily matter to, to learn this. They can actually still use the information on the prefix. But it's useful to know where it's comes from. It's, it's useful to kind of know a lot of stuff like corn or it's not corn or you know, so it's, it's that sort of stuff. This is just one second. If you have a collect, I have five minutes ago, this one and I thought, okay. Um, if you have a collection of texts, so it's the stuff your students produce, you can use, there's free software and paid software, you can create your own forms. Just basically, here's some from my own research. I found a bunch of texts about something I was interested in. I put them all in here, and then I could start doing searches and getting little quick results. So I get my little statistics. So you can create, if you're, you know, if you, you know, it might be that at the end of the, you want to put all your student essays if it's gone at that level. I need to find what other students, if some patterns will help. Let them do some searching in that as well. Okay. I won't say, I won't say anything about that because that's all. But you, you have to spend a couple of hours learning how the software works. I think it might be worth it. You know, it's, it's um, okay. That will be a link in, on the website. Okay, so to conclude, you know, what does that mean for the classroom? Well, pretty much what I should use it. There's two ways to use it, other than for cheating and crosswords, is prepare your exercise. You don't, don't waste your time saying, what are all the words beginning in B? Yeah, I'm just going to start listing them. Do a search. You have it in seconds, and you have it sorted in. Frequency, so you know which ones are most common, you can have them sorted by genre as well, so you see which, one, which ones are more, most common in the children's station. Why not do that? I'm asking you, so you spend 15 minutes tonight learning how to, how to use the focus, maybe 30 minutes, and then, you, you know, in the next year, it will save you 10 hours. I think that's a good investment of time. Some students, uh, on the course, uh, on the search of language course that we run, some students actually use in the classroom. It kind of depends on your learners, it depends on your, your pupils. But I would, I, actually, it isn't that difficult to learn the codes. You know, it, it may seem like a lot because I'm kind of just sprung on it. But if you, if we have a time and you can just try it immediately after seeing it, it, it would be just so trivial. There really is nothing to it. So let, let them do it. You know, give it to them as homework. Go here, do a search, and see what you can find out. Some of them will, you know, will love it. Some of them won't. But you know, so try it out, and it has been successful. I'm not the only person talking about this. There are books written about how to use language proper in the classroom, for corpus to the classroom. There are, there are several books you can find on Amazon. There are some websites of the core for learning that will have links to these things. So, so it is, now I think it's the time not to, I mean this has been around for about 20 years. It was accessible to teachers, but it was not that easy. Now with the internet being at the level it is, there's no, there's really no reason not to use it because it's free for everyone. It's available online very easily. I particularly recommend this book if you're interested in language. Michael Stubbs has done some amazing work, work on particularly on collocability and collocations and how things how and how that influences meanings of words. So questions we may have to be on the break for lunch, but I'll answer maybe one or two. Why Brigham University? Is it to do with Bible study? Absolutely. The, the Summer Institute of Linguistics is another great resource for linguistic materials. People going around the world translating Bibles, whatever you think about the sort of the missionary aspect of their work, the linguistic work has been true, as they've saved so many languages that, that they're doing great work. So biblical studies have actually contributed to the that's the course. reason they had today. That is absolutely the reason. That's the reason why they use other, there are many other places where this happens, but, but they have been one of the more kind of prominent, uh, yes. Yeah, just following on that question, that, that ties in, doesn't it, to a translation facility into a language learner. There are parallel corpora. I actually created one for English and Czech some time ago, and uh, and there are some better ones as well. So so, but um, generally corpora for, for most languages and most people with advanced corpora will reside at a university, and you have to kind of talk to them either pay or so. The the Coca people have a Spanish corpus as well as Portuguese corpus, but that's you know but that's it's relatively small. And generally these won't be as easily available in parallel corpora. Not, and it will be very specific for language. There, there are many, 
They're just not as easy to access as, as the COCA, which is what I want to see, which is what I recommend. Oh, absolutely. It will find it in, and it will, even if you use some of the, uh, the, the language of the corpus, it will find you whether there are variations on the idioms. You know, so I would maybe cats and, cats and dogs, or as there are goats and cats, it might be interesting. You know, if you, if you can find yeah. these sorts of things. So, so yeah, so absolutely. However, many idioms, some, of, some idioms can be quite low frequency, so you may not necessarily be able to compare the idiom frequency. You have, or you can, but you have to check whether the sampling, which samples they come from. So, yeah. Well, you wouldn't put the idiom in brackets, because the idiom is just, isn't, doesn't have a lemma. You only put single words in brackets, but the idiom is put in the idiom as it is. And it will find find you now. Time is up. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Very much. And I'll answer questions.